you know, it's only recently we've heard those kind of terms. When I was a kid, it was just, I was filled with imposter syndrome. Just, it was almost 90% of who I was. I just didn't think I was good enough. Hello folks, Richard Smythman here. So today it is my great pleasure to bring you a conversation I had with artist Patrick Jones. Patrick is one of the leading fantasy artists working today. He's also an amazing figurative artist and educator. And when I was thinking about doing this podcast more than a year ago, it was the idea of having a conversation with Patrick that inspired me. His work is both beautiful and inspirational, and it was just wonderful to get a chance to talk to him. Really want to check off the bucket list. So I bring you Patrick Jones. I think it'd be really nice to just kind of start at the beginning. You grew up in what I'm guessing was 1970s Northern Ireland. Um, oh, yeah. A politically pretty tumultuous time. Um, well, yeah. but, but tell me, where, whereabouts did you grow up? Well, Richard, it couldn't be the worst place. It was in Ardoin. And I remember saying to my dad, Dad, why are we on the news all the time? <laughs> Even on the Oprah Winfrey show in the later years. He says, because this is a horrible place. So basically what it was is we were wrong. We were right in the middle of it. It just happened to be a, and you know, the, the director, Kenneth Brenner, you, you know, he made a movie recently called Belfast. And that is so close to where I was from. So yeah, there was just riots all the time. When I actually went to see that movie, yeah, I had a little tear in my eye, you know, because you know, it wasn't the worst place. Because the people were terrific. People were really nice. And, you know, I was close to Ukraine there also last year. And they were collecting for Ukraine. And, and you know, that was, and I did a little benefit for it as well. And it reminded me of the news report coming out of Ukraine, how brave the people were and how funny they were too. You know, they would laugh in the face of horror. And that was very like where I came from. L laughing in the face of horror was very common. It was very, it was an odd place, no doubt about it. But being so young, I didn't really feel the trauma of it. But I can imagine now what my parents were terrified, I'm sure. You know, because when you're older, you really know the consequences of a, a gunfight in the street. Whereas as a kid, it's just fire, it's firecrackers. You know, you go, oh, wow, funny noises out there. You knew what it was, but you have no sense of more, mortality when you're a kid. You just think you're going to live forever. And with that said, you know, like growing up in that environment, what was, how, how, did, how does a young Patrick become a fantasy artist or even think about being an artist in well, that kind of environment? It actually was pretty easy, Richard, because, it, you know, first of all, the money wasn't plentiful. And so the cheapest entertainment was comic books. And, you know, you could get them. I, there was a kid down the street and I could only buy one comic book a week. But there was a kid down the street and he had tons of comic books. And so I would swap them out with him. So I would continue to buy my one a week until I had a collection. And then we'd swap our collection. And then we found out there was another kid a few streets away and he had a collection. And then we'd swap back and forth there. So in a kind of Instagram way, it was like an early internet. We, we got our resources by on foot. <laughs> now we walked around. Right. And swapped things. And that way I was able to collect the stories from Marvel Comics and not EC Comics. I didn't see them till I was uh, later in life. But the great thing was is that the Marvel Comics that I loved, the Jack Kirby era, were actually republished. I only found this out recently. Were republished in a British edition years after they were in the American edition. So obviously they must have gotten some deal together. And the great thing was they came out at exactly the same time as the Warren comics, which I loved as well. And so it was like all the best of everything at once. It all came at once. And they released them week by week as if it was happening right now. So it was years later that I realized that I was reading 1960s comics in the 70s. But it was right. And was the, this was main, mainly superhero stuff, yeah? Yeah, it was the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, you know, so there was me, my early introduction to art. So for me, there we only had one art gallery and it was a modern art gallery. 
And, you know, it was in a dangerous area, Richard, so I couldn't go there. So there was no art at all, uh, apart from the public library. Was that kind of the genesis of your thinking, I want to be an artist growing up? Yeah. Oh, so I was going to say yes right away there. Uh, but no, it wasn't because I was just talking to a student the other day, actually. And he reminded me of me. He was some, He's a Mexican student. I do mentorships. And he's a Mexican student. He's just left home. And he's, you know, he's doing it tough. But he's a young guy. So he's full of vim and, and vigor. He can just handle anything. And that was me. So it didn't really bother me to leave Belfast to go to London and end up in a squad, for instance, because to me it, was, it wasn't any hardship at all. So a bit of what, what was bad about the place was actually good about the place because I, had, I was fearless to go anywhere at all because everyone sa- everything seemed safe. You know, even living in Brixton, and Brixton was a no-go zone. Taxi drivers wouldn't go there. I thought it was marvelous to hang out there, go to the markets on Sundays. It seemed great. Were you doing art? Were, like, what were your resources? Because I know for me, like in the in the mid eighties, early mid eighties, when I was starting to get into animation, um, I you know you could go to the public library, but there was just nothing there. Like you know, yeah. you might find the odd book here, the odd book there, but you really had to go out of your way to kind of get yeah. educated, so to speak. How, what what's, what was your experience with that? Yeah, the same. I think the dearth of oh, oh I think this, Richard. I'm a very I'm a big optimist. And I think the dearth of knowledge was actually a good thing because it had me more focused on what to study. Whereas today, everything's out there. You don't. I, I meet loads of students, and they say, "I don't know what to do," because there's so much to choose from. Yeah, and there was nothing for me to choose from. So I was really immersed in these Marvel comics, and that's when I learned that you could be an artist because Marvel comics, DC didn't, but Marvel comics would put in. Uh, the credits for the artists, they'd say written by Stan Lee, if we can believe that, and drawn by Jack Kirby. You know, and I went, this is a job. But the best revolution, revelation of all was that cover art by Boris Vallejo. That changed my whole life. Before that, I was heading toward Disney. I just, because that's all I had. I had Disney, and Disney only released movies back then in the cinema, and you never saw them again. But they did release one for television. It was called The Three Caballeros. And I, I couldn't believe that I was watching a movie. You know, we both worked in animation I, I, less than you do. But I teach drawing for animation. And the Three Caballeros won an, an Academy Award. And it was one of the only movies. I mean, there's lots of them, but in Technicolor. So when that came on the screen, it was incredible. And I was just mesmerized by it. And I thought, I'm going to be a Disney artist. That was the first inkling that I was going to be an artist. Just that, I just want... Because Disney also came on and showed a little bit behind the scenes as well. It was a TV show. And Richard, this is only coming to me right now. You know how memories are totally buried? That there was a Disney show on, and that's how the Three Caballeros were shown. And it started with the Disney castle. But most of it was documentary. It was about wildlife and stuff. They did all these wildlife things. and But Disney would take you behind the scenes and show you the artists working in the rotoscope and you know flipping the cells and stuff. I thought, that's a job. And so that was my first inkling that there was a, a living to be made at it. I had no... My family, there was no artists in the family. And yeah. so it was a really working class family. That's why I identify with that movie, Kenneth Brown, a totally working class family. And so I had no inkling that there was anything at all. All I knew that the work was in London. That was the only phrase I knew, the work was in London. And I took a boat over there and, and yeah, just, sense. just threw my hat in the ring. It was a really dangerous thing to do looking back. But it's that thing as well. Not dangerous in a sense of I felt danger. But, I, you know, poverty was right there because I didn't plan at all. And But I think ignorance was my superpower. So I went there with a hundred, a hundred pounds. Imagine how quickly that was doubled up. And, you know, basically we thought, okay, with no understanding at all, I just land in the street and go, okay, now what are you going to do? You've got to be an artist. Didn't know anyone, no one. So you, so you hadn't actually really done any kind of professional work or anything before you left Ireland. Oh no, no, I did. I did. I did. Oh, you did? Yeah, I was doing work 
uh, I, I was one of the first people to get the Prince's Trust grant. That's why I always had a soft spot for Prince Charles. And so there was a grant for people in really deprived areas that had no hope, basically. It was just that. But they didn't want to spin it like that. If you've got no hope. But it was really that. If you had no hope and you had a business idea, they would listen to it. And I had a business idea. And it was a very simple one. It was basically I was just going to paint portraits uh, in a above my dad's shop. And so you had to prove you could get a space. So my dad gave me the space above his shop. So I had that and enough you know, enough to convince them that I was I was worthy of this trust. And it wasn't a big deal, the trust. It basically just meant that you could work tax free for a year and you could also claim unemployment benefit. And so basically you were an unemployed business person that didn't have to worry about paying tax. Which, if I had that today, I could make a fortune. <laughs> but at the time, we knew that you were going to not, if you'd be lucky, they said it to us in the seminar, most of you won't be here next year in business, right? They said that to us clearly. It was really tough talk. And if you break even, you're a big success. And they were totally right. You know, I couldn't make it. I couldn't make it at all. I was broke by the end of the year. But I did go to London with the a better knowledge of what it's like to run a business because I actually at the beginning did quite well and where was the wrong time that I was the guy to go to to uh, get photo retouching done so this was before uh, Photoshop and so I, I quickly acquired the skills in airbrushing and I didn't know anything about airbrushing either I had seen an, a comic book in town and it said and it was obviously self-published and they'd walked around and dropped it into the, the stores and at the back of it, it said, if you think you can draw for our comic book, then send your work in here. And there was an address on it. And it was one something place in Belfast City. And I went, I looked out the window of Easton and I went, that's that place over there. I could actually see it. I mean, there's miracles in the world. And so I walked across the street and rang the bell. And the guy says, <laughs> I says, look, I've just got your comic book here. Uh, I think I can draw for your comic book. And he says, come on up. And so I started working for them. And it was that's the first time I met professional people. And he said, have you heard of an airbrush? He says, your work looks airbrushed. And I was painting. He gave me the cover and everything. Once he saw what I could do, he gave me the cover and the inside story. I was like, for that brief moment, the star of the of the comic book. And it was called Zemoc, which is comic backwards with an X. And... I was also in the Navy at the time. I joined the Navy. And so I had some cash. So I was home on a six-month uh, deferral. You know, it's like you go for six months and you can come back for, you know, anything from two weeks. I was there for six months. It was a big, big chance of me. And I was being paid the whole time. So I was the richest kid. I was the richest kid in the street. And so when the guy says to me, have you heard of an airbrush? I says, no. And he said, it looks like your work. It'll cut time down. I says, Really? And, I, and he says, he says, have you got any cash? I says, lots of cash. And he said, come run to, to the art store. And he showed me what I needed. And I just picked it up. And he says, you need a compressor. And you got to get a silent one. They're very expensive. And I just picked it up. And I basically walked out of that shop with all the gear that he recommended. And from that point on, I was a professional artist because I was doing the photo retouching and, and got the Prince's Trust grant way after that fact because I went back into the Navy again came back into poverty again because I left the Navy. Someone in the Navy says to me, you're wasting your life here. So I was painting portraits of the of the um, the captain's wife and stuff. And people were going, can you, pay, can you draw my wife? And I was going, all I'm going to do is this. And so I left the Navy. I thought, they kept sending me, you're wasting your life here. And, I, and I, you know, I wasn't. It was the most marvelous time, three years of it. And it was the most marvelous time. And so I, I threw that in. And when I came home and said, I've thrown it in, everyone thought I was crazy. You know, I, I got really bad uh, family grief for that, you know, right through to the uncles, you know, or as the guy threw away a career. But it was the best thing I ever did. Yeah. What was, what training had led to that? Or were you completely yeah. self-taught up to that point? Like, Yeah, there was zero training. Absolutely none at all. I can say that if we, if you had a job back then, you were considered uh lucky. So people used to say to each other in the street, when they met each other, they didn't say hello. They said, are you working? They actually said those words, 
because it was they were hoping the best for you. So I know that I mean when I went to London on employment, it was I saw two crashes. You've seen them yourself, but in the early eighties there was a crash, a financial crash, and then in the nineties again, and I was there for that crash, and it was ten percent of the population were unemployed, but where I came from in Ardoin, it was ninety percent. Hardly anyone was working at all. So they, they averaged the percentage odd, but there was nobody working in that. It was rubble. It was just rubble. And so, like I say, my superpower was there was nothing to lose. I just went to London. And I've always considered my portfolio my passport. I just thought, so like I said, I met Chris Achilleos when I was over there. It was a dream, you know? I said, How am I going to meet this guy? And he just walked into the studio one day. I was talking to another guy called Chris. And he said, uh, he says, oh, I love fantasy art. And it was a greeting card studio. He says, oh, you might like my friend Chris. I says, not Chris Achilles. He says, he's coming in this afternoon. I nearly dropped dead. I was all nervous. I was all nervous. And we became best of friends. Sadly, we lost him last year. You know, that was, you know, you know I don't know what he, he died of. Uh, but it was one of those unfortunate things where I go to America every two years. And on the year I don't go, somebody turns up at the convention, and then the year I go, they're not there. And so it was the year I didn't go there. I could have met him again after many, many years, because I hadn't seen Chris in a, in a, what, 30 years or something, when he went to a LuxCon. And I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting to meet Chris after all that time. But yeah, I, when I went to London, what was, what was really amazing, Richard, is if you've got, I believe, if you've got a goal ahead of you, and you really believe in it. And I know it sounds like you know, diatribe, but nothing was stopping me. Nothing was going to stop me get in there. No matter what. It didn't matter to me. I, I could sit. I was homeless for a while. I could be homeless. It didn't matter. I'd still keep going for that goal. And I remember, you know, like we think about our, our families don't want us to do this because that's what they see. They see that future. And I didn't care. And now today... You know, my dad's very proud of me, has my books on his shelf and everything. But at the very start, he really thought, there's no hope for this boy. So one thing I learned from my dad was being self-employed was a possibility. Because everyone else I knew wasn't self-employed. They were employed. And they used to call my dad Sweet Pea. And I used to say to my mom, why do these people come to the door all the time? And, and you know, men would come to the door and they'd talk to him for a while. He says they're looking for money. So my dad would give them money because he couldn't employ them at some times, because he employed people. He was a plasterer that ended up with his own crew of five people, and they would be three sometimes. And so he could take people on if there was a big job, and then he would have to let them go. And it would just be him and the crew of three again, my uncle and my other uncle. So, And then he would take me on too. And that's how I started working on the building side. So like I said, I feel I'm lucky because when I went to London, it wasn't long before I could get building site work. That was that came pretty quick. You know, I just walk onto your site, and I was a tough looking kid, you know, because I'd come from there, and I just walk on the site, and they just look at me and they say, "You're hired." You know, they just come on in, just see that you can lift the, you know, you can lift a bag of cement on your shoulder. That's all they were concerned with. That's all you needed to do. And once I was in there, I bluffed it as a plaster. You know, you hear of cowboys. I bluffed it. Because I did some of it. Dad would sometimes say, you go and plaster the cupboard, you know, where no one can see. Because he didn't want to crawl in there. So he'd do the big walls and he'd send me in the cupboard. So I knew enough to make a little wall. And then I would spend all night, because I was on the night shift, I'd spend all night smoothing that big wall out until it was done. And the guy would come in and measure it with, you know, uh, he'd put a level on it and stuff and be all right, you know, but he didn't know that I'd spent all night on soaking it every minute. You're supposed to do it in like half an hour, it's like six hours on it. But there was so much money involved in being a trades person rather than the labor that I managed to start getting some money together by being that cowboy. I was actually pretty good at it after a while and cut the time down. So how long did you do that for? Uh, I did that for, it could have been a year six months, I think six months and then parts of it because I was still only getting bits of work. Uh, but once again, someone on the building side had seen my work and said, you're wasting your life here. And I says, well, I, you know what? I, I owe my dad money and I 
I want to pay him back and this is the way to do it. He says, your dad will wait for it. And he was right. He was absolutely right. My dad seemed awful tough to me, but he did wait for it. And so, you know, things, because he got me out of trouble. I was in trouble from being self-employed. You know, I just went, I couldn't pay the rent and stuff. And I got this big job from Dublin. <laughs> Dublin? I got this big job from Dublin. And this guy gave it to me while I was in this, the Prince's Trust uh, thing. And he gave me a big advance. And then he left me with the job and it was horrific. It was so much work. And I fell behind on it. And the more I fell behind on it, the more it accumulated the, the amount of work that had to be done. It was going to be a, a show that went around Italy and back. It was the biggest break you could ever hope for. But I wasn't ready for it. And he became uncontactable. Because he was, he was a very famous writer, actually. Can't remember his name. But he went off to Milan with no contact details. And I fell behind so far. And when he came back, I just looked at him and I says, I can't, I couldn't do it. I'm just one person. And it was going to be lots of artworks that would display in galleries along, all down Italy. And it would turn, the, the images would turn on and off. 500 of them or something. And he chose, he chose the style that I did in that comic book, which was really intricate. I went, how am I supposed to do that? And I tried to shorten the time. I made it in my own light box with just a kitchen table and a lamp. It still wasn't enough. And he, he wanted his money back. And so that's what I had to get a loan for, to give, pay him his money back. And he was swearing his head off. He says, I'll never hire an artist again. The last one I hired threw himself down the stairs. So he had, you know, he could put another guy in the, in the poor house before. So he yeah, won't say his name, but boy, he was, he was rough. But it given, once again, if it wasn't for him, I would never have not missed a deadline for the rest of my life because I knew a deadline meant you were dead. So that's the reputation I got was you never miss a deadline. He says, you are, your name around town is so, it's so gold because you never miss a deadline. And that followed me all the way to Australia. Everyone said, give it to Patrick. He never misses a deadline. Never. And, uh, you know, that was a learning experience. You know, at the time it was a lot of money to me. But looking back on it, it was just a slap on the face that said, you know, here's something you've learned. Don't do this again, because next time it could be really serious, you know? You, you mentioned that you worked for Disney. Was that when you were in London? Yeah, when I was in London, Disney, you'll never hear this again, got in touch with my agent and said, we understand that Patrick Jones works in this studio. I was headhunted by Disney. Now, the last time you saw that, if you got the book, The Illusion of Life, I have it here on, I've always had a copy of it. There's a little photo or a, a drawing in it where they have two scout hunters in a car with big ears and you just see their backs and, and they go scout hunting for talent because that's what they had to do in the early Disney days. So there wasn't enough talent for this big production. And I was the end of that era. They were still looking for people and they looked for me and they asked me to do something very unusual. They said, we want you to draw Winnie the Pooh, and we want three stages of it. We want a sketch, we want the middle part, and we want the, the end of it. We want it colored. And they said, and it has to be exactly this pose. So what they were putting in place was to make sure I couldn't go to a book and trace it and, you know, and call myself a Disney artist. So they wanted to see all that. And once they saw it, they said, you're on our books. I never heard from them again. Until I went came to Australia and they tracked me down again. <laughs> so it was really weird. It was very strange. And then I had that back then. I don't know if you still need that. It was kind of like a certificate. This guy's approved by Disney. I don't know if that still exists. Oh, wow. Such a I weird... don't think so. I don't no, think I so. Think mm, so I haven't heard of it. Mm. No, but I had the same thing here in, in, uh, in Australia when I was working for Warner Brothers to begin with. They wanted me to draw a Foghorn Leghorn. Do you know that character? Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And it was an advertising agency, but they weren't allowed the art direct. The advertising agency was not allowed the art direct me. I had to be art directed directly from Warner Brothers. They weren't allowed to put their hands on it. And so I did I did Fog Horn Leghorn for an ad approved by Warner Brothers. And you know what, Richard it put me off. It put me off working for Warner Brothers or anything again because they were so they were into the minutia as I has to be exactly this far apart. You know, it was nearly impossible to put an expression on them because they were so 
litigious in how it should look that it has it was like yes you would have to trace it in the end because they did so many corrections to it and i went never again never going to work for these guys again now, where, where did the fantasy art fit in it, it, during this time? Were, were you still, is that something you were still developing? Were you starting to work in oil yet? Or where, was, where were you at with that? The fantasy stuff was unusual because I started in greeting cards from another place. Because if we reel back the time again, when I landed in London with that 100 pounds, it was totally gobbled up and I was homeless. And so I was back. And, you know, just in really in one pair of clothes, I was back to trouble times again. And I was unemployed and I went to the unemployment office, office which I swore I was never going to do again for a very brief time until I got work on a building site. And then I, I, and it was such a chore to be unemployed. You know, the time you could, you go in there in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, take a ticket and it would say 900 on it or something. And by five o'clock, you weren't seen and they'd say, come back tomorrow. Soul destroying. It really was. Because I was living in the poor place too. I was living in Brixton. And so I I was searching around for work. And in Brixton, there was so much unemployment that they actually had a special little unemployment shop that you walked into. It's so weird. You walk into and it had cards on the wall. And you could take a card and it would say, um, identical twins wanted for a movie. <laughs> you know, it was really weird. And it was really like a magical store. And it had a poster because it was, you know, it was, it was Brixton. So it was, it was, you know, it was sort of preaching to people that would live there. And it said, Stevie Wonder's blind. You've got no, no excuse. You know, so it's really weird. You can get away with that poster today. And so one of the cards, I was—I used to go in there every day and look at the cards, just because it was so weird. Only in London would you see that. And one of the cards said brass text on it. It said, if you've been unemployed and can't get work for six months, it said, you can come and work here on a trial. And I went, okay. And I went up to the woman at the desk and I says, I want to go here. And she says, it's, it's a bus ride up there. I just walked it in about an hour. I walked up to Streatham. And there it was, brass tech, and walked in the door, and they employed me right away. And the employment was just basically, um, they didn't employ me right away. It was an art studio, but it was people, they weren't allowed to make a profit. It was a non profit situation. And I walked in with my portfolio and I showed it to the guy. He says, That's really terrific. And then he didn't call me back. And I rang him. I had agency, always have. I rang him and I said, chase it up on that interview it seemed to go really well and i'm just wondering why you didn't give me the job and he said you were too qualified hell does that never heard anything like in my life he says i he says i'm on the bones of my ass i see i need a job and he says well we the studio manager position's gone which is what we would have had for you he says give me anything and so I went. they give me the job i went in there and was just the guy i was just another one of the guys helping out with the art and in there, I got a contact. That's when all the contacts happen, when you meet people in the same boat. And they said, uh, there's a green card studio looking for people. And that's where I went to meet that guy who introduced me to Chris and Cleos. So that's the, I was flotsam and jetsam. I had a dream I was following, but on the way, so many things happened. And once I was in that studio, I met guys really on the up now and some film studio people come in one day and they were talking to my friend who was just, he was, this guy, every opportunity, he took it, you know? And he had a sports car and he was just a young guy. He said the police were always pulling him over because they thought he was a drug dealer because he had a sports car. He made it all from art. And I went, that, that's, a, that's a guy to be inspired by. And these movie people come in and they were asking him to do um, movie production work. And as they were walking out the door, they saw my stuff and they went, oh, whoa, <laughs> he said, uh, any chance you want to come and work in the moves? I mean, try that. That's not going to happen today. That's not going to happen today. Because they were working on fantasy movies. And there it was right there, fantasy movies. And I says, I'm not going without my partner. Because they were, I think they were basically going to let him go. I says, I'm not going without my partner. And so they took the two of us to Pinewood Studios. And that's where my big fantasy career kicked off. I was working on fantasy movies 
from a marvelous guy called Peter Snell, and I never forgot him. And only recently there, I was thinking about Peter, and I thought, I've got to, this is something I, I really regret not doing, because Chris Achilleos left us this year. And I thought, I'm not going to have that again. So I checked out if Peter was still around. Peter Snell, he's a Canadian producer. He owned British Lion Productions. And I sent him an email. He was still around. I sent him an email, and I says, Peter, I wonder if you remember me. You were really kind to me. You really backed me up in times of trouble and, and encouraged me. And I've never forgotten you for it. I says, and I just wanted you to know that. And he got back to me. He says, Patrick, of course I remember you, you know? Because we were really good. We were really good friends. He says, you have any, if you have any movie ideas, you know, let me know. He's still making movies. He still just saw one on Netflix the other day. So that was one of the great things about being an artist. It's what a what a beautiful world it was. Nearly everybody's nice. You know, there's going to be a couple of villains here. And part of the story where I said you backed me up was because somebody seriously tried to rip me off in the movie business back then. And Peter wouldn't have a bar of it. I won't say it here, but it was such a, it was such a dynamic play when this guy that ripped me off turned up in Pinewood Studios to butter up here. And I, went, I looked out the window and I said, Metton, you will not believe who's just walked into the car park. And I rolled my sleeves up because I was going to give him a bit of Belfast. That's, I was still young, you know? And he says, don't, don't start anything. I says, can you, this guy? He says, he's coming in to talk to Peter. He's a ripoff artist. And I remember later, there was a kerfuffle. The guy tried to shake my hand and I just shouldered him out of the way because Peter was there. And Peter says, have you met? I says, I met. I didn't say anything, but I just shoulder put, pushed past him. I was so furious. And um, and I was packing my stuff when my partner came in and met him, and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm finished here, aren't I? He says, you're not. He says, I told Peter the story, and he says, anyone that treats Patrick like that is not working with me. And that was, you know, it was really nice, and I couldn't believe it. I, I thought, I'm, I'm down here, and Peter's up there, and that other guy's up there. They're on the, the same level. I'm finished. Not at all. It's so nice to hear like, when people have your back like that. Yes. Yeah. You know, could have easily gone, gone a different way. Um, really? So that's kind of like, that sounds like that was your first big break, yeah? Like I'd say so, yeah. That was my first. In many ways. Yeah. And then, so you, and you said it was fantasy films, anything that we would know or? No, they weren't made. And that's the thing as well. I met an, an older guy here uh, working on Warner Brothers. And he's like, he was, he couldn't drive anymore. That's how old he was. And so I would drive him from Brisbane into the Warner Brothers down the coast, which is down in, in the Gold Coast. And he wanted me to be in the slow lane because he was a bit, he didn't like the traffic because it was too scary. And so, oh, sorry, he would follow me. He'd follow me in the car. And he says, can you go slow in the slow lane? And so I'm in the slow lane and he's behind me and people are honking because, you know, there's only so slow you can go in the slow lane. And we were pushing it, you know, but I couldn't lose him because I, I was fearful for him. He said, you have to stay with me. And so I said to him, you know, he's been in the movie business 15 years. And I says, uh, where would I see your work? And he says, in the um, 13th Warrior. And I says, oh yeah, I haven't seen that one. It was, uh, remember that, that Spanish guy. And uh, that I said, I can't remember. So my I'm, my brain's just a, a frazzle now. And I said, and I was waiting for more because he's been in the business fifty years. And I says, and and what else? And he said, that's it. I says, you only worked in one film all in your life. He says, no, I worked in hundreds of films. He says that was the only one where my production art was used. He says the the, the other movies didn't make it, or my work didn't make it into it. So you know that part us is uh, I worked in two movies and neither one of them had made. But then in, when I, you know, but Peter didn't lose faith. It wasn't for that reason. One of the movies was so close. I mean, we thought this is it. One of the movies was so close to being financed by the Bank of Bermuda. And it turned out that the script we had, that's why they keep the script so secret. The script we had, Peter Kimenez's production stops. I says, why is that? He says, Masters of the Universe just came out. He says, go and look at the script. Go and look at the plot. And it was our plot. It was the same plot. You know, people say that, you know, everyone's got an idea. Well, that was two people with exactly the same idea, almost carbon. 
just by coincidence, just by coincidence. So much amazing work that just, um, yeah, just never quite makes it. But yeah. it's kind of part of the process. And and you you but you've done visual development since then, have you? Or, or, or was yeah. that it for you? Yeah, no, I worked on two movies. I worked on one of the biggest movies in history in Australia. The biggest movie, actually, the biggest budget movie in Australia ever made was called Peter. Well, it's Peter. I call Peter Pan like it's a you know it's a big film. It was Peter, Peter Pan, and it was such a massive budget. And when I went in there, I already had a big reputation at that point for never missing deadlines, for instance. And I was working with uh, a producer called Peter Ford, who had um, he had produced the uh, Pig in the City and stuff. He had a huge, huge big background for making movies. So when I sat down with Peter Ford, I was very comfortable in my skin by that point. I wasn't as terrified as I was when I worked in Warner Brothers to begin with and met Bruno Ribeiro, who was the production designer on Platoon. And I was working with him. When I met him, I could hardly speak. But by this point now, everything was going well. And Peter just says, uh, like I say, I've always had agency. And I said, I says, Peter, I've only got so long. Roger, sorry, Roger Ford. And I, I said, I've only got so much time in the day now because I'm very busy in advertising. Is there possible I can do this from home? Unheard of back then. And he says, what would you like to work on? He gave me a choice. I says, the pirates? He says, that's already done. It's already gone. I says, the mermaids? He says, yeah, you can have the mermaids. And it was back then when, and that's not back then, it's all the time, I suppose. But when we were talking money, because I have to have my own, you know, I have to, I represent myself. And he says, so how much, it wasn't him, it was his sister. He says, how much is this going to cost us? And I said, because I'd seen my friend do this, I wrote it down on a piece of paper and shifted it across the table. And they went. <laughs> and he said, and he shifted the paper back again. He says, that's, that's fine, but don't tell anybody. So I wasn't to tell the other guys because everyone's, they're all, uh, you know, negotiating for themselves. Don't tell anybody else you got that that price. So yeah, it, it was a big, everything's a big learning experience. And so was that was character design work, or was it yeah. very more just mood paintings? That it happened? was mood paintings and character design, and also production shots. And so, I never. This is terrible. I'd never seen the film, but I remember going to the cinema, and I had done a production shot in full color of when Peter Pan meets the mermaids in a in a cave, and I went to the movies, and Richard, I I was knocked off my feet. Because I thought, because it's only 2D, it's on a piece of paper, I can go crazy. I can do a big cove with a big ship in it and everything. You know, they're not going to be able to afford it. They put, they did it. And I was in the cinema and, a, and they showed the promo for it. And I went, I cannot believe it. You know, that poor guy standing was only in one. There it was. It was just live. It was in all the colors, the composition, the, the position of the mermaids, everything. They took that art and they... They must have took it on set and said, here's where this all goes. And I was so proud. I was so proud. I mean, it was feeling in my heart too. It was weird. Because it all comes back to you again that once upon a time, you were this kid standing in rubble saying, I want to I wanna be an artist. And there you are in a cinema, in an air-conditioned cinema in Australia, and a widescreen production comes on and there's your work. It's, it's astonishing. You know, it really is. It makes you, you get all existential. You go, is this real? Did I, did I invent all this? You know, when I look at your work, of course you think fantasy art, but I also, I, I would almost consider you like a fine artist, um, first and foremost. But when did you start to look at figurative art and figure drawing and really decide to develop that skill? What was that process like for you? Well, I'm the same as you, Richard. I. You know, we both went into, into the industry, boats and all, but didn't I didn't have the skills for it. I didn't think anyway. That's why I always say to my students, you know, don't wait until you've got the skills. If there's an opportunity, take it. You'll learn on the job. And so I, I did that. I was learning on the job all the time. And I always felt I didn't. There's always that imposter syndrome where I thought I don't have an education. And so I did. I, my world went in reverse for a while where I went into, um, you know, later in life went into education as a student to get qualifications and then really enjoyed the campus life because I didn't have it. And so when I was on campus, and this is in my 30s, 
I was on campus and I was really happy. I went, this is, this is the dream come true. This is what I always wanted to do. Be on campus. And, you know, you used to see it in the American movies. It's hanging around on campus. But I was really diligent because I was already a professional artist. So I'm, walk, I'm working on, I'm the student on campus. But the guy that's teaching me is, is just looking at the stuff on the screen. Because by this time, I've got two agents, one in New York, one in Los Angeles. I'm just basically doing this because I feel like an imposter. And I says, what's the assignments? He says, there's no assignments for you. You just do anything you want. You just let me do what I pleased. And he, he, he graded me on that. Like I said, I've got a charmed life. And then before I left, he said, he's called Peter Kewen, so I want to acknowledge him there. He says to me, Patrick, could you, would you mind teaching figure drawing at, uh, you know, this to the fashion students up in, in Nambour in, in Australia? And I thought, well, I better learn how to draw the figure. <laughs> I'm going to teach it. Now, I had walked into a figure drawing class a couple of times back in London when I was starting out. And to be honest, it was terrifying. And there's something about London in the, in the winter that makes everything terrifying. And I remember going to the Elephant and Castle in midwinter and I come out of the Elephant and Castle tube station and it was just bucket and dawn rain and I could see the art college across the road and I was shivering and I went terrified <laughs> terrified to walk across that road and I went in and it was just a classic old school you know you could smell you know how old schools just smell it's had that smell of you know half half washed floors with detergent you know it had that kind of thing you know not a full job and so i went in and i i did life drawing up I, I had to be the worst in the class i mean i was just ferocious at it and it kind of put me off for a while and so i i read respectively and you know i'm learning by basically just being on the job but i always felt i was the figures weren't quite good enough because I was just copying what I saw, you know? And that's one of the worst things you can do. And I was getting so good at being a copyist that I ended up being a photorealist, and I really hated it. I really hated it. And people said, wow, your work looks like a photograph. And for me, that was the ultimate insult because I'd lost all my style. I was just basically all due to people to do that. It's a wonderful uh, discipline, but for me, six months of it and I, I couldn't I couldn't breathe it again. I couldn't do it. I just give it up and started drawing cartoons, which I always loved, which I did since childhood. And I loved them. And I, I, I thought I burned a bridge here because that was quite lucrative for me. And then I was really good at cartoons and all of a sudden making more money by burning that bridge. You know, you got to take a chance. You got to take a chance. And so I had to learn figure drawing to teach it. And so I looked at books. I started with books. Bern Hogarth was a big influence. Uh, Peck was, was big. Bridgman, I'd never quite got my head around. There wasn't enough gesture in it. By that point, I'm very gestural with my cartoons. And then I discovered the new Masters Academy, uh, you know, when they just opened the doors, really. And Steve Houston was teaching. And, you know, I'm already teaching classes how to draw the figure by this point for years now, based on just those books. And I always thought, because someone said to me once, you don't teach like anybody else. And I kind of slinked away because I thought I'm discovered. But what it was is I was teaching it because I was teaching it the way I wanted to be taught. And it wasn't until I got the Vice Chancellor's Award nomination that I realized, hold on, what I'm doing here is actually pretty good because of all the teachers, they've come to me with this award. And I thought I didn't know how to teach. And so... I started looking at the New Masters Academy during lunch breaks, and I saw Steve Houston draw and Glenn Vilpo draw, and I went, I have been doing this right. These guys, they teach like I do. They think like I do. They're drawing with enthusiasm. They're not doing this dusty thing where, you know, let's start with cross hatching. You know, they weren't doing it. They were just getting straight in there with the gestural lines. And I went, I breathed a sigh of relief, and I learned so much from them. There's always more to learn. And over those 10 years, I think I got so much better. Rocket fuel. I could have, if I had had that back then when I was 20. But you, you know, Richard, I, I believe that there's no right time to learn. Because when I'm learning this stuff later, I've got a wealth of, of knowledge behind me you know, and a wealth of experience that makes me learn easier. I'm, I'm an easy study now. 
where it would have been hard at the start because I wouldn't know what a gesture line is. But by that point, it's it's already in my blood. So I, I believe there's no way, no no clear As long as you've got the passion, you can always reverse engineer anything at all. And I think that it comes actually back to something that I, I was reading in the, the Power of Osmosis um, and I wanted to touch upon because I, I'm pretty sure I when I read in that, when I was reading the book, you bring up the, the sentence, learning how to learn. What was what was the um, you know the inspiration behind that? Yeah, well, it was that very thing, Richard. It was going into a class and meeting all those. You meet a whole plethora of of different kind of students, but you can really put them down into five. You know, the personalities are are big. You know, there's a big difference in personalities, but there's five kind of learners. You know, and you know them when they come in. And like you say, there's the guy with the Dunning Kruger syndrome. He comes in, he already thinks he knows it all. And by the end of the class, it's the little mousy person that, you know, always apologizing for the work that come out as gold, you know, because they've listened to everything. They've understood that having to listen and learn is, is important. And they grow steadily and then they grow really fast. Whereas the other guy just flatlines because they've come in with their ears closed. They already believe they know everything. My, once again, the luck for me was having a dearth of knowledge was once again, a superpower because I had to learn how to learn because I didn't I didn't go to college. And so I had to go to the public library and understand how to learn. And it took a long time. And then I started doing shortcuts. It'd be better if you learned it like this. You know, don't try and do the whole book at once. Go back one to three pages and then move forward, you know? You know, enjoy the plateau. That's where you learn most. All of that stuff I learned from not having a teacher. And so I was very, I was very well armored to learn anything from that point because I always had that and I think what you said was very true that if you're an eternal student then you're going to be an eternal teacher and if you close one of those doors you're just going to be one or the other and so if you're always willing to learn you're always you're always going to be able to teach and I've always thought if you don't I mean Einstein said it he said if you don't understand something completely then you can't explain it simply and so I was always looking for that simple answer to a complex problem. And that's a hard thing to unlock. And I kept unlocking that all the time. And so by the time that I was a teacher, I think that was my success that I went in there feeling like an imposter, but I had learned how to learn everything. And, you know, a lot of the teachers are coming from a background where they were taught everything and they walk in and then they just repeat their teacher again. They just repeat what they learned from the teacher verbatim. I mean, I had, you know, there's always teacher wars. I have students say, my teacher says that you're not supposed to do that. You have to use an eraser. And I go, well, you know, that's true. You can do that. He says, but you said don't use one. I says, well, you can use one and you, can, you don't have to. He says, but which is it? I says, it's your choice. <laughs> you know, so they, they don't have the critical thinking because they're locked into one system. They don't, they've got that. I mean, I remember it was, we all laughed about it and that we shouldn't have laughed. We did. I remember all the teachers got together because we're in university by this point and I'm in, I'm teaching in the most prestigious university and they just let me go. They just go, there's your class and that's it. There's no, show me your lesson plan. Show me this. There's your class. And they leave me there and I, you know, bring out great students, I think. And they're all, all my students are working in the, you know, in industry in Brisbane there. They're the art directors, you know. It's like you could walk in and go, oh, there's my class. So I'm doing something right. And, you know, when I'm teaching that stuff, it's, I feel it was that. It was that strength where I remember the kids said, because I said this one thing. I was one of my great models. Have you been looking at my books? Alana Briegelman's. Uh, she's a doctor. You know, the life models have got a life so uh, colorful you wouldn't believe and Alana Brickelmans is a doctor and she's incredibly clever and she's got a couple of degrees she's doing like a double one at the same time and she uh, I said to the class so here's what I recommend that you do this method and then at the end of it I says and then just do the opposite and she I remember her writing that down as teacher inspiration she wrote it down in one of her her blog says, teach your inspiration, then just turn it on its head, just do the opposite. Right? She thought that was an amazing thing to hear. And the kid put a complaint in, because he anonymously put complaints in. And we all sat around the table, 
and the guy says to me, Pedro, we've got a got a word with you. I says, Really? Never had anything but praise, you know? He says, We've got this and he burst out laughing because they thought that was an incredible, insightful thing to write. And they were laughing because the kid was dumb enough to get angry and go and write that in the thing. We shouldn't have laughed, you know? But if it wasn't an anonymous thing, I could have went and sat with that kid and said, look, here's the thing, you know? This is a very important learning thing. But because it was anonymous, I didn't know who it was, so I couldn't help him. And if I brought it up in class, and it was obviously being rambled and stuff like that. So that's a kid that didn't learn how to learn. That's a kid that's just learning by rote and doesn't understand how to unlock how to learn. I think that there's also some confusion with figure drawing in as much as to some extent, there's kind of two schools of thinking. You've got the you've got the Glenn Vilpu, Steve Houston, Patrick Jones kind of approach, right? And, and which is, at least from my experience, it's much more it's much closer to probably the way that the, the Renaissance artists drew. Yeah. And then you've got the academic approach, which obviously came later. You know, this idea of drawing out graphs and plotting and site sides and that, which for me is so completely alien, yeah. um, that whole process. And ultimately, in my mind, just ends up producing very stiff, very uninteresting drawing. Um, and I actually, I don't know if you would agree with this, but for me, <laughs> yeah. that academic approach feels far more like craft than it does art. Yeah. What do you think about that? It is true. And I, I believe the t same thing too. Uh, that academic rigor for me is just too, it's too crushing. I can't work within that. But like everything, there's always a germ of truth in everything. And you know, that's why populists are popular. You know, there's a germ of truth in everything they say, even though they continue with outrageous ideas afterwards. The, the germ of truth will, will get the idea across and people go, well, oh, that's true. I believe that the academic method is really useful if you can break it. But if you don't if you're not prepared to break it, then you've got you're gonna get stuck in that that rigor. And I was talking to Elia at the New Masters, and he does teach the academic method. And you can see his work is much better than what you would expect from that that site size measurement. It has a fluidity to it. And he said to me after six years or something, Russian Academy is really intense, six years or eight years or whatever they do, of intense academic rigor. He said, what I have to do is unlock that now and try and do, what can I do? What can I bring to this? Because this is a method that has to be undone to some degree. Like Picasso said, spends all his life learning this craft and then tried to learn how to be a child again. It's that, that same kind of thing. You've got to, it's, it's important, I think. I think it's important to learn the rules and then break them. But to try to break the rules before you learn them, you know, that's back to that thing again. You don't know how, you, you haven't learned how to learn first. So like I said, it's a conundrum. And I often say, you're, I'm going to, I'm going to um, say things that are going to come back on me all the time, but everything's a different situation. Every single thing you do is going to require something. And it might be academia. It might be something like that. For me, I don't use any site size at all. I just, I've tried it. And, you know, you've got a wobbly hand. By the time you get over to your page, you've moved the pencil. It seems pointless to me. And so I just move my eyes. I know it looks quite sinister, just your eyes moving across. I keep my head as still as possible. I measure by eye, which is, you know, it's a conundrum, isn't it? It's side side me method. It's really not using your sight. It's using just the, the measurement. It should be called measurement. And sight size is what I use. I just use my sight, size it onto here. And you can just see the flicker. All you have to do is look at your work and look at the model and look at your work. And you'll see that, you know, persistence of vision, which are from, from animation. You can see the flicker. You can actually see what's wrong with your drawing just by doing that. And that's, once again, me learning how to learn. I learned that. I learned that because that's what worked for me. And so I was willing to break what is a traditional thing and do what I wanted to do because it worked better for me. Because I have people asking me this all the time. It's like, well, can I do can I do this bit of drawing digitally? Or yeah. can I learn to paint digitally? And I've come across a lot of students that their one experience with drawing and painting is in a digital realm. And they've 
barely ever really drawn in an yep. analog way. What are your thoughts on that and, and the yes. pit, potential pitfalls that there might be with that approach? Well, we're, we're handling a lot of hot potatoes here, aren't we, Richard? Yeah, we are. This treatment. I think, <laughs> I believe that, because I work back and forth on these platforms. And so I worked in only digital for, geez, for, because I was pushed into it by advertising studios. And when they first said to me, can you do it digitally? I went, oh, really? So I had to go and learn. That's why I went back to, that's why I went to college when I was in my thirties to learn that stuff. And I said, and they says, because he first said, look, we can, we can use your work, but it has to be A4. And I went, why does it have to be a can't painted A4, a giant billboard for, for this, you know, Australian post office with some guy coming down the street with dogs apart? You can't do that on an A4. He says, why does it have to be A4? He says, we can fit that on a scanner. So that was, that was me having to get into digital work because I was doing billboards and the you know, I wasn't going to be able to work that size. And I looked into getting an A3 scanner and it just was pointless. And so I, I went and learned how to do digital work. And I was there for about 10 years doing that stuff. But I never let go of drawing. I always kept that. And so I think it's destructive in one sense, but it's incredibly freeing in another. Because I hadn't painted in oils for bits and bobs here and there. But I hadn't painted really seriously in oils for about 10 years when I was in advertising. And that big Luxcon show come up and it knocked me out of my stupor. I could have been advertising until I was on my deathbed. And then I realized that Boris Vallejo was going to be there. And I'm going there hell or high water to meet this man. I can't believe he's somewhere, you know, like we go back in time again about the, the Bluth studio in Dublin I had no idea about. But now with the internet, I know this man is going to be in this position at this time, and I'm going. And so I, I got in touch with the people. Pat Wilshire it turned out to be a great friend of mine in the long run. But I got in touch with Pat Wilshire, who was running the first event. And I said, because uh, I saw the tickets were going on sale, and they were very expensive. They were like $300. I didn't care. $300, I'm there, even if it's in America. And the tickets come up, and I thought, okay, I'll buy one of them. And they were all gone. It was one of those times where you take the moment, you, you seize the day. And I thought, I'm not going to see Boris Faye, who am I? And then I said to Pat Wiltshire, I said, Pat, is there any chance that I can come to the show as an artist? And he says, who are you? Who are you? And I says, I'm Patrick Jones. And he said to me, Patrick Jones of the Eastern Press artworks? And I went, that's the power of art. It's a passport. I says, yeah, you know my work. He says, there's always room for Padre Jones or something to that effect. And my heart just filled up again. I went, this world's amazing. And so not only do I don't have to pay $300, I'm actually in the show. But the thing was, yeah, the thing was though, it was an original art show and I had no paintings. And it was six months away and I had to fill a wall of art. And I thought the only way I can fill that wall is to paint big pictures. I can't paint little ones. And I painted three big canvases that filled that wall. And when I pulled those, those oils out again and looked at that big white sea of canvas, I went, I can't do this. And you know what, Rich? I put that brush on the canvas and I was off and running faster than I was before. And the reason for that was I'd been working digitally and the digital tools taught me to be fearless because, you know, you just mix the color and you throw it up there and then you can undo the layer. I was, I was working like that, like it was a digital platform. So I think it's useful, yeah, for students to take themselves out of the digital realm, do some traditional stuff and come back in again. And Justin Sweet, another great artist, is very like that. You'll see he's always drawing and painting. And then he does all this digital stuff for the movies because it's just quicker. You don't have to mix the paints. But I see him at his booth and he's just painting. He's got the brushes on because he knows that's the secret. The secret sauce is traditional art, and that'll because there's no one do. I'm um, I'm very curious on how schools and educators are preparing their students for what is, in my opinion, the eventuality that AI will be part of the process. 
Um, have you had any experience with it yet? Ha has it has it affected your work or or your students in any way that you're seeing yet? What what's your thoughts on that? Well, I just lost a dear friend there recently. A really great thinker, and we worked together at QUT, this university that I work at, and we had a big sit down, a big uh, discussion about that very thing. And he said the idea of grading papers of anything at all, you know, it's five years from now, you can forget about all of that. So we were talking about how do we, we can't put our heads in the sand like emus. It's not going away. They've already scraped the data of millions of people. It's out there. It's never coming back again. You know, you can't put it back in. You can't, what was that analogy? You shake a, a bag of feathers into the wind. And I go and try and pick them all up. Like, well, it isn't going to happen. And so... We were talking about strategies about what is teaching now. Uh, so do we open up the box and say, here's AI, go use it and show me what you can do with it. And that was basically the consensus was that's what we're going to have to do, you know, because it's not going away and it's not going to, they're not going to stop it. You know, there's I got Stephen Zapata there as a big campaigner to take them to court. If they could only just be more ethical with it, you know, I type my name in. I, t I tried it on, type my name in, put a few prompts in, awful work, awful work. And then once I got the idea of how it worked, there was a piece of work that I could have done. You know, it just looked like my work and a couple of more tweaks and it was my work. But if there's no tweaks to it, then it's, it's still just a sad version of who you were. And so I believe that if we could just be ethical with it, then it's another tool. Like for instance, when I used to do that photo retouching, I remember Lockheed got in touch with me to retouch out a sky behind their airplanes because it was it was here in, it was in Belfast. The sky was always horrible. And so they wanted a big sunny sky. And so they'd come to me, they came to me that one and it was a huge big photo. And I put a price in for it that uh, you, my friends would have, you know, eyes would have popped. How can you charge that for just, but I did. And they kept coming back. They went, you're the man. You're the man for this job now. And Lockheed would come to me all the time to get their, just to get their skies blue. That's all. And of course, along comes the computer, Photoshop. Forget that job. That job's long gone. Nobody's touching that. And so I would do photo retouching on, on a computer and I'd be lucky to get a couple of dollars for it, you know? But in, back then, they'd pay me huge dollars to airbrush out a sky. And so there's a job gone. And I remember the portfolio in London. Everyone had a photorealistic picture of a Mars bar in their folder. It's like the running joke. You'd open it up. Be a Mars bar in here? Because they knew that was the big campaign that, you know, is it, who is it, Cadbury? I can't remember who makes Mars bars. But they had a huge budget. And so everyone wanted a piece of that photorealism. And Photoshop came along, boom, gone. And in fact, I remember thinking, those Japanese artists who have honed that photorealistic craft for their lifetime are now completely out of a job. So we, I used to, we used to get these annuals and one of them was photorealism in Japan. And it was astonishing to see what you could do and not required, no longer required. The only people that could do it well were people like Soriyama who would airbrush robots that look realistic. And now his, life, his career is still going, you know, if he's still around, I don't know if he is. But he's still bringing out art books with all this, this stuff in it. So if I was young again, if I was 20, I'd be frightened of it. There'd be no doubt because that job that I did, you know, anybody can do that now. So that's what gives me solace as well. I didn't, my career wasn't over when Photoshop came out, just moved on and did other things with it. Yeah, look, it, it, it's a tricky subject. For, there's no doubt. And I, it is something I think I'm still formulating my thoughts on it because I do think that it's actually also incredibly exciting. Oh yeah. Um, I but to be honest with you, I've seen work come out in the last year or so with, with from AI, which looks incredibly original uh, and isn't something that you would have seen necessarily come from an artist's hand. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's that's got huge potential. Where you are now in your in your career. Um, what still motivates you? What still keeps you excited about about creating art? And what do you feel like you've still got to accomplish? Yeah, well, 
I was just talking to students the other day and I was thinking hard on it and I went, you know what, of all my accomplishments, I think that my biggest accomplishment is, and it's, I know it sounds Mr. Chips and everything, is basically the teaching part that I am now talking to students and, I, and they come in from my mentorship and they go out the door at the end and they're different. And I think that, that if you can change a person like that, it's almost a magical thing. And I think that that's what I'm going to be most proud of at the end is that I can sit back and look at these artists grow and become, you know, these great art. They're obviously going to be terrific at what they do. They already are. So I'm proud of that and want to continue that more. But the stuff that I have got ahead of me, I can't talk about. <laughs> non-disclosure. Non -dis you know what non-disclosure is all like, Richard? You sign in those things all the time. But I have, I have a non-disclosure thing in the works that's very exciting. And once again, it's it's not just working for someone. It's total agency. It's something. It's a new realm for me to step into and and own it. So I've got that ahead of me. But for now, I'm really happy. Like I say, enjoy the plateau is one of my big mantras. I'm enjoying the plateau of teaching and learning more all the time. And in fact, I was watching Brian Cox the other day, the astrologist, and he said, "I love it when I'm wrong." He says, because that opens a whole new door. I'm just paraphrasing. But he was basically saying that means there's something new that he doesn't know. And he's really excited by it. And you can see what a great teacher he is. He's always enthused about learning. And he has got no qualms like the great side. There's always no qualms about saying I'm wrong. And this is something new. Whereas you, once again, you get the Dunning-Kruger or just a bad politician that just says you're wrong and I'm right. And, you know, I'm turning that stuff all the time off. So negative, I can't even look at it anymore. You know, I'd look at one news channel and go, they're the bad guys. And I'd look at the other news channel, i see they're the good guys. And now I'm looking at both of them going, yeah, I've had enough of this. You're both babbling away there. You know, if we can just get into the gray area and all agree that we're different and we can change by agreeing on those differences and agreeing on what we don't know, and then we can learn how to learn. You know, I think that's what's missing. Everyone goes, I've learned this, and that's that's the Bible now. I've learned this, and this is my Bible, and they're butting heads. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, basically just always being the eternal student is what I have ahead of me, and I'm happy with that. I really am. That's so nice to hear because I look at someone like yourself, and I, I see a level of mastery that would suggest that you, you're done being a student, but um, <laughs> no. it's, it's, it's really nice to hear. Um, the Anatomy of Style 2, The Power of Osmosis, that came out in September. Is that right? It's 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 very recent publication. Well, it's very recent, yeah. It's, I just launched it the other week uh, along with Proco. And I'm excited by that, by the way. I'm excited by affiliation. I'm excited being here with you, Richard. I love, I love affiliation. And it was something I really didn't even understand to begin with. And I didn't want to be part of it because part of me was going, I'm me. And if I affiliate, I'm a weaker version of me. And didn't realize that I was closing the door on myself. I was not, I had stopped learning how to learn. And I realized that affiliation with other people is a wonderful thing. And I think it always has been. And we're all too closed in our shops to say, oh, I, I trade in this area. And if another ice cream, remember the Glasgow ice cream wars, if another ice cream thing comes up the street here, then it's going to be war. Whereas there's always room for another ice cream truck. And so my affiliation with now the new masters and Proco has been just like being young again. You know, I feel like I'm eternally young because there's always something new happening. When I went to Los Angeles to work with the new masters, for instance, and I stepped off the plane, I'm used to that now, stepping off a plane. I've been to Los Angeles many times, but to actually get into Los Angeles and realize that Looking back in that classroom 10 years ago when I watched Glenn Vilpu and Steve Houston teach in those hallowed halls of the new masters, and then to walk into that room, open the door, and there it is. And there's the seat that Steve Houston sat in, and now I'm sitting in it, and they're micing me up. That kind of stuff is a thrill of a lifetime to me. You know, I'm just totally thrilled. And then I went on to see, I thought, while well, I'm in Los Angeles, I'll go and see Proco, because those guys have been so good to me. You know, they they just just open to affiliation. Their big thing is affiliation. 
And so they don't mind me promoting my stuff on their platform. They promote their stuff about me, you know, everywhere. We're just helping each other out the whole time. And I thought, I'll go and see Proko. I, I, you know, I've made friends there. Christian Nees is a good friend of mine now. Does a little podcast called The Sketchy Van, which is really worth looking at because he talks to the artists about anything but the mechanics, nuts and bolts. He just talks to the artists about what motivates them. Where are they going with this? What's the reason for it? You know, the existential stuff is, is what he's he's talking about. And that's thrilling too. So I went and saw Christian. And but I thought to myself, I'll go down and see Stan. And I was back to that point again where I haven't planned this very well. I'm up in Los Angeles. I'll go down to San Diego. And on the way I might pop in and see Jeff Watts. And so, you know, just manifest that stuff. You know, once upon a time you go, I can't go out and see Frank Frazetta. Well, you can't anymore. But we were on our way to see him before he died. So I thought, you know, it's manifested. I'm coming down to see Proko and walk, walked into his studio and saw all the new stuff happening. It was just wonderful. And then went down, to, uh, saw Jeff first, went down to Jeff Watson, saw Jeff. And I remember getting out of the taxi and I was hoping to get in there before Jeff Watson just sit in the back of the class so he wouldn't notice me. I'm going to just sit there. And I'm, I'm standing in the car park and the taxi driver pulled up and I said, uh, and Jeff was getting out of his car. It was very early. I thought I'd get in before him. It was very, he was getting out of the car. And I said to the taxi driver, that guy, guy's really a big, big artist. He's a big artist. And I'm, Cause we were talking about what we did. He says, go ahead and meet him. And I got out and I thought, I'll just walk. And I says, Hey, how you doing? He says, Hey, hi, Patrick. I went, what the hell? He says, you know, he says, of course I know you. Uh, come on in. He showed me around and we sat together. He says, you got to draw? And I was hoping he didn't ask that. Turn that. You know, draw, right? <laughs> I said, you know, what can I say? Of course I'm going to draw. I have to. And I sat and drew. Uh, and luckily he was right, wasn't right beside me. But uh, it was a marvelous experience. Really fantastic. So what I say to everyone as well is, is never wait till you think you're good enough. Just go and you know, go and sit with Jeff Watson draw and see see what happens. I think that there's there's this perception that that you know everyone's kind of working in isolation or that we're very protective over our particular space or we don't want to share ideas or thoughts. But I got people ask me, I've had them ask me several times, what do you think of this artist or what do you think of that artist? Kind of potentially kind of expecting me to be like, oh well they're not great or like, you know, yeah. some kind of negative response. But you know, like I look at people like Steve Houston, obviously yourself, Stan with Proco. I think that all of these sources have been absolutely invaluable to my development as an artist. Yeah, I mean, including them, people obviously that no pe people wouldn't have heard of. People I've worked with in animation that are incredible animators or artists that don't get enough attention, in my opinion. I do have a final question for you. Um, what would your advice be? to either young artists or your young self, if you were going back and if you could give some advice to 10-year-old Patrick, what would it be? Mm. It would be have more faith in yourself. It would definitely be that. So kill the imposter syndrome. You know, I've only, you know, it's only recently we've heard those kind of terms. When I was a kid, it was just, I was filled with imposter syndrome, just it was almost 90% of who I was. I just didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think I was good enough in a social aspect. Because I remember going to London once, and I asked these people once in the street, and I said, do you know where uh, I'm trying to get to this place? I was going to it for an interview or something. And they were the poshest people in the world. And the guy was just looking at me like a creature from another universe. And then he just got in the car, like I didn't exist. And I went, what the hell? And shame on him. Shame on him. You know, to squash that imposter syndrome even even tighter. And then I meet the most wonderful people from every strata and realize he was the anomaly. And so it's very easy to say this person's like that and they're all like that. And then I discovered that that was an anomaly. So for me, uh, take the imposter syndrome out as, as soon as possible. And Open your heart to the fact that we're all the same. Everyone's the same. You go to, you know, I've been to all around the world and you see the, the, the news and you go, oh, these people are terrible. That 
oh, imagine going there. Don't go there. That's so dangerous. That's the news. Most of the world, I mean, they have to be. Otherwise, there would, there would be chaos. It would be like uh, Night of the Living Dead out there. If we believed that everyone was like we see on the news, it would be a zombie apocalypse. So I, I believe, believe in yourself. Everyone's going to help you. And always lift people up. Lift the person up next to you. Never put anybody down. And then they'll lift you up. Everyone should be lifting everyone up. That's what I would say to me going back then, because I was very guarded and very wary of people because of my social status was so low. So I'd say, I'd go back and say, Hadrick, don't worry about it. Everyone's the same. So everyone you meet, they're your friend if you want them to be. Feel it like that. And never, ever dodge your skills because you've got them. That would be what I'd say. What a great way to end. Patrick, thank you so much for doing this, really. It's been fantastic. And I really hope we get a chance to do do this again, because I, I, I would actually really like to deep dive on a couple of very specific subjects with you at some point. And thanks, Richard, by the way, for having me on. We all enjoyed it. Uh, oh, my pleasure, really. Um, folks, you want to learn to draw? Check this guy out. Go, go click the links. Um, by the way, the website, fantastic. Just Thank beautifully you. put together. Um, I've looked through all of those preview videos um, more times than I care to admit. Um, but there's a, the wonderful resources there and obviously links to the books and the other materials. Patrick, thanks again. And um, yeah, let's do this again. Oh, yeah. Right. Just hit me up anytime, Richard. It's been a pleasure.